Well, today I'm going to give you five tools or tenets that I find helpful when I'm peering into the fog this far. And for starters, all the smart people tell you to prepare for the future, you need to understand your past. And I have an advantage working for ARM because I travel to Cambridgeshire, England several times a year. And to tell you why that is really important, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to take us all over there, 5,000 miles. frequent stops for me, the Eagle Pub in Cambridge, and it's going to come back in the talk uh, later, but to understand why it's important for this uh, first tenant, you need to know that uh, every time I go to the pub, I pass a uh, plaque, and the plaque is the original Cavendish lattice. Now, Maxwell's the father of modern physics, but there's a lot more than one on in this lab right next to the Eagle. Uh, Discovery of the electron, understanding of atoms, understanding of light, so much of our industry's foundations, lots of Nobel Prize hardware. So every time I go out for a beer, I get a little smarter through osmosis. <laughs> now, the second tenet of predicting the future, as we all know, is you have to take some data and you have to plot it on a log scale and extrapolate it way out. Now, I'm not showing you Moore's Law here. This data is in dollars. And this data is telling us that by the year 2030, we're going to spend $1 billion on every patterning tool going into the factory. Extreme ultraviolet light has passed this $100 million mark. There are a number of reasons why it's so expensive, but I'm going to pick one. It's the mirrors. Now picture 75 microns of flatness. That's thinner than your hair. But to scale for this mirror, you need to picture that amount of flatness across the country of Germany. That's some serious engineering. And by the way, these mirrors need to be coated with atomically precise layers in an arrangement called a Bragg reflector. And if uh, that name sounds familiar, you just saw it. The fourth Cavendish professor wrote that while he was walking along the River Cam, he came up with this idea of how x-rays bounce off crystals. And for that, he became the youngest Nobel Prize winner ever. So when I go over, I also walk by the River Cam. Um, I actually tried yesterday, I went to the River Guadalupe over here, and it did not go as well. Uh, so we now have another dot, which is high NAEUV. Now what is that and why are we doing it? And that gets to the second Cavendish professor and this equation from 1896 that's dictated all of the expensive progression in litho tools in our history. To image smaller features, he tells us you can make a smaller wavelength of light or you can increase the angles of light that you're collecting, that's the numerical aperture, NA. Larger angles mean bigger mirrors. This is a test chamber for some of the new mirrors in the second generation EV. And bigger mirrors mean bigger boxes. So for reference, this red outline is the existing EV tools. They take three Boeing 747s to ship. Now speaking of ships, the US Navy has a laser powerful enough to zap missiles out of the sky. Underneath this box, there's a laser more powerful than that. It's also zapping lasers out, uh, things out of the sky, 50,000 droplets of tin a second used to create the light. Now, if this seems crazy to you, three pre-orders have been placed. I think this might come around 2024. But even this impressive amount of engineering is not gonna get us to 2030. So what are we gonna do by 2030? Well, we don't have any definite ideas. And one of the key problems is sheer information density. EUV tools today, push the equivalent of 30 million UHD TV screens worth of information onto each wafer. So if you extrapolate that up to 2030, that's asking a lot for any top-down patterning technology. Ideally, what we'd like to do is build the information from the bottom up, and that brings us to the topic of self-assembly. And self-assembly starts at the Eagle Pub with this plaque. Now, what was going on in uh, 1953? That was Bragg in Cavendish. Uh, X-ray diffraction, this particular image led to the discovery of the structure of DNA and Nobel Prizes for three of the four people working on it. It's another pub discussion. Uh, so back to the Eagle, um, with something that's important, they just ran on the prop to talk about it. 
So I could actually go into the Eagle and I could sit at the actual table where this discovery was success, uh, discussed, and I could continue thinking that I'm getting smarter by drinking beer. Now, fast forward 40 years, and people started modifying the Watson Crick binding rules to modify the shape of DNA. And specifically in 2006, Paul Rothman showed how he could customize the binding locations of DNA, add short pieces of DNA called sta staples, and get the DNA to self-assemble into specific shapes. Here are some of the shapes he created by self-assembly. Now, by comparison, our three nanometer sea moss is gonna put two crude gate lines down in the area where he's making smiley faces and stars. Now, dumping a lot of stars on your wafer isn't gonna help you. That gets us to Lulu Chan's group and fractal assembly of larger tiles. What they did is they ordered up a test tube with one of Rothman's tiles, they ordered up three more, and they programmed the edges so they would only connect in a certain way. Mixing them, they got a larger tile. Doing that a second time, they get even a larger tile. And finally, they get an eight by eight tile with the same technology. When they were done, they created the world's smallest Mona Lisa, 700 nanometers. Now, our $255 million high NA EUV tools won't be able to make this. Who made it were two postdocs, an Excel spreadsheet, and $20 worth of DNA. And they get about a billion copies of this per test tube, so you're looking at about a 20 nanocent Mona Lisa. And they have an nifty online tool. You can upload your own picture, and it will show you the DNA coding. You can order these from companies online and do this at your own home if you want to pick a different picture. Now, there are concrete ideas about how we're going to go from this to this in 2030. But I want to show some of what Richard Feynman called room at the bottom. So first of all, the Mona Lisa is tiny, but a billion copies in a test tube equal an area larger than this dye. And at the scale of DNA origami, you could make this dye two millimeters by two millimeters, or you could put 6,000 cores. But DNA doesn't have to sit flat on a wafer. It can be 3D. If you want to dodecahedron, no problem. On the right, Harvard has pixelated this process to make just about any 3D shape you want. So this uh, uh, die could actually be a cube of about 130 microns on a side. So Richard Feynman, correct, 60 years later after the entire progress of Moore's Law. Now, uh, there's a lot of uh, speculation that we'd ever want to use this, but I want to, I want to bring up a third tenet now uh, of predicting the future. We spend a lot of money in R&D in this industry, but there's one industry that spends more. And that industry is curing cancer in mice using DNA origami. So this third tenet, tenet piggybacking means we can expect the pharmaceutical industry to make a lot of progress by 2030 with DNA origami that we'll, we'll be able to use for our own devices. Now, history tells us, again, the speculation, history tells us we're gonna figure out a way to pattern things in 2030. That's been the bet so far. What will we be patterning? Now, our industry has literally squeezed a great run out of CMOS. But by 2030, the switches are going to be six times smaller and lower power than CMOS can probably get to. There are replacement candidates coming, most from new materials and new physics. And that's the trick I put into the title of the talk today. By 2030, we're going to be dealing with new kicks besides electronics in order to progress compute. Now, mercifully, I don't have time to cover all these. I want to just t talk about a couple. And I want to start, actually, with the trivia break. How do you measure a volt? Well, according to the National Bureau of Standards, you put this thing in a microwave, and each of the dots generate a voltage that's proportional just to physical constants, no variables. Those dots are called Josephson junctions. Named after a 22-year-old physicist who predicted strange things when you sandwich two superconductors together, Yes, in Cavendish Labs, under Neville Mott. Yes, there's a Nobel Prize. And yes, there's a plaque I can walk by and feel smarter near the Eagle Pub. And you can make fast, fast logic out of these things, using only little millivolt burps of power and very compact layout. It's exciting stuff. It's very difficult to design in, and the EDH rules don't exist yet. It has to be cooled, so stay tuned. But you can actually use a Josephson junction-based computer today. But rather than making flux quantum logic, these computers put the 
junctions into something that creates a qubit. This is the circuit from the IBM Q quantum computer. Now, most people agree that general purpose quantum computing uh, is a stretch even by 2030. There is, however, one application that these early generation of quantum computers do well, and that's chemistry, atomic bombs. And to illustrate why this is interesting, consider that making fertilizer uses 2% of the world's energy, 5% of the world's natural gas, and creates more methane than all other industries combined. That's to feed us. Yet there's a microbe that can do this easily. We just can't figure out how. We know what molecule is using, we can't figure out how. Quantum computers in the near future should be big enough to simulate this and crack this mystery. So a list of similar breakthroughs by 2030 with quantum materials simulations should be astounding, but it's also very important to us in this room. It's quite likely that by 2030, quantum computers will have dreamed up new materials that we can harness for conventional computing. Now, word of caution, uh, Joseph junctions could be the point contact transistors of quantum computing. We're early into this. Good start, maybe not where we end up. There's lots of different ways to make qubits, including good old CMOS, as well as photonics. You'll note that uh, Cavendish Labs is still going strong under its ninth professor. They had to move to a bigger location outside of the city. Now, speaking of photons, they're a holy grail of conventional computing as well because they're fast and they don't bump into each other. But we have a problem. We've been so good at scaling CMOS that the transistors are actually smaller than photons. And by the way, this picture is not to scale. This is. But there is a promising way that could harness photons for computing. And that's with something called a plasmon. A plasmon is an interaction between light and matter that can compress the photonic information into a smaller space. For reference, here comes a photon right now. Now, in order to harness a plasmon, you need interfaces between metals and dielectrics at precise nanometer features. You then enter the exciting world of metamaterials, which are creating all sorts of new physical properties. The field of metamaterials holds so much promise in other areas that tenant number three applies strongly here. Metamaterials can free us from the bonds that Maxwell, Rayleigh, and Bragg have kept us for the last century. Here's another person's opinion, uh, former CTO of Microsoft. Now, if only the metamaterials researchers could find someone who's good at metal dielectric interfaces with nanometer precision, they'd be onto something. So that's, that's to say that tenant number three also applies here in reverse, which is tenant number four. There are a lot of technology options out there. Not many of them are going to bear out. But when two areas can benefit each other, that makes progress much more likely. That's why I have a lot of hope for plasmodic metamaterials by 2030. OK, Greg, you're excited about a lot of material, uh, new materials. So I have a question for you. Whatever happened to graphene? Well, it turns out you can get a Nobel Prize for using scotch tape. But seriously, graphene will change our lives in many ways. It's just not a good semiconductor. It doesn't have a band gap. It did unlock the Pandora's box of 2D, 2D materials. And there are many new materials showing up now uh, as candidates. But there's something interesting going on here when I say many. Here's a paper from last year that identified 51 new 2D semiconductor candidates. Another paper identified 57 more. There are currently over 2,000 2D semiconductor material candidates, and they're showing up in bunches all of a sudden. So I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, should I be investing in scotch tape futures? Well, that's not, that's not what's going on here. Here's the papers I just showed you. They're not scotch taping, they're coding. They're coding from another Nobel Prize at Cambridge, not Cavendish, this was chemistry, but I'm gonna take it, where modern computing became powerful enough to allow you to simulate chemistry from the ground up. Now, each one point on one of these papers takes several days of simulation, so it's just in its infancy. But as we make more powerful computers, we'll get more uh, uh, material sessions back, which smells like tenant number four to me. And just for grins, I want to point out that they're also identifying potentially better qubits with computational uh, chemistry. And of course, they're gener generating a lot of data, and machine learning in this field is just taking off. So to summarize, 
Today we have FinFest and Silvia. By 2030, we'll have new materials dreamed up by this first generation of quantum computers. We'll have computational materials and uh, associated machine learning methods giving us potentially thousands of more materials to deal with. We'll have metamaterials giving us new physics. And we'll have DNA origami that can make all this stuff. In fact, if you're looking to burn some time, try Googling DNA origami of metamaterials, and that'll keep you busy for a while. Now think of where we were 15 years ago. We had uh, one 2D material, uh, DNA origami had uh, just been invented, and we had very, very little in terms of computational chemistry. Project that to today, and then go to 2030. It should be mind-boggling to you. It's the exact opposite of Moore's Law's ending, what are we gonna do? Now, at our research, of course, we're monitoring all this and uh, interacting where we can. Um, I wanna show you a couple mirror-term materials projects that we do in our research. Here's one example where we're partnering with Applied Materials and a material invented at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. It also gets back to Cambridge and Cavendish Labs. So uh, Neville Mott challenged some assumptions in the math of the foundations of semiconductors. And he came up with some new device uh, ideas and he won a Nobel Prize for this. And this correlated electron material that we're working with uh, works as a memory via a bi-directional Mott transition. We think it could make neuromorphic computing more efficient, as well as potentially make uh, better embedded memories. Another example involves what would appear to be strange bedfellows, arm and Unilever, <laughs> computer chips and deodorant. And it turns out at Unilever, there are the world experts at sniffing armpits. But you can't take them with you when you travel, so how do you travel with confidence? So with the material from Manchester and novel manufacturing from Pragmatic, we're endeavoring to build literal slim AI chips that sew into our pits and help you solve this vexing problem. Now you may laugh at the example, <coughs> but this uh, example of a vertical uh, collaboration from materials up to applications is what you can expect more and more of as we get to 2030. Now I've been highlighting a lot of interesting technology today, but I wanted to finish by going back to 10 at 1 and the success of Cavendish Lab. Today I showed you only seven of the 29 Nobel Prizes to come out of that lab. You'll find that Cavendish Labs is actually at a place called the New Museum Site. And that's because at the time of Maxwell, physics was taught in the museum. But Maxwell saw, saw that there was innovation in physics to be had. It needed a new way of doing things. He needed a full lab. Uh, the university didn't have this kind of money. Uh, and he was up against an establishment that's typified by this kind of quote. And keep in mind, he hadn't published his famous paper yet. He was just a young upstart, raising a bunch of eyebrows. But he persevered. And three years later, the same year that he published his famous equations, Cavendish Labs was born. As you can see, open, collaborative environment, and you know the history now. And I believe TechCon retains that kind of vision. Which gets us to the fifth and final tenet of predicting the future. The best way to predict the future, or better yet, create it, in this coming era of very dynamic technology change, is to connect with other parts of the ecosystem. And TechCon affords us that ability, and it is the way to 2030. So thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your TechCon.